A game in economics is a situation in which the outcome for all depends on the choices of each. The outcome of a poker game, for example, depends not just on the strategy you play, but on the strategies of all the other players. The same thing goes for democracies. The outcome of an election depends not so much on your vote as on how most other people vote, even if each vote influences the outcome a little bit. Game theory tries to simplify how we think about strategic situations by constructing models. But that means we have to be careful when we apply simple models to real life with all of its complications. We should always ask what we're trying to do with models and what relevant facts we may be leaving out. One assumption game theorists make is that the individuals they're modeling are rational. This doesn't mean we assume the players are unbiased and perfectly informed, but it does mean that when they face a set of options, we assume they rank their preferences from best to worst and act in ways they believe are most likely to accomplish their goals. Here's an example we can illustrate with a model. Suppose you want to know if two people will trade with each other. Let's call them Odin and Loki after the Scandinavian gods. Odin makes swords and Loki makes shields. If they peacefully trade a sword for a shield, both are better off. But if one steals when the other was prepared to peacefully trade, one benefits a lot while the other loses. If they both try to steal from each other, then they'll end up fighting and neither will benefit. Will the trade happen? It depends. The first thing to notice is that neither Loki nor Odin can choose an outcome. They can only choose a strategy. In other words, each of them can only choose what he will do while trying to predict the other player's behavior. We can model a game like this with a box that we call a payoff matrix, which lists different possible outcomes associated with different actions the players might take. The payoffs could be piles of cash, years in prison, or just about any other outcome we can think of. A common way to fill out a payoff matrix is by assigning point values to different outcomes, or by ranking the outcomes from first to worst. In this example, Odin is player one and Loki is player two. The points on the left side are Odin's payoffs, and those on the right side are Loki's. The specific numbers we choose to represent the payoffs don't matter. The point is to represent the relative attractiveness of each option. If Loki and Odin peacefully trade, they both benefit. We'll assign 15 points each for that. But if Odin successfully steals a shield from Loki without giving him a sword, while Loki was prepared to peacefully trade, Odin gets to keep his sword and gains a shield. Let's assign 20 points for this outcome for Odin and minus five points for Loki. If the situation is reversed, the points reverse as well. Loki gets 20 points and Odin gets minus five. If both try to steal, they waste time and energy fighting just to keep what they already had. Let's assign them zero points if they choose to steal. Both players would be better off if they traded, but each player rationally selects a strategy that leads them away from this outcome. This is because stealing gives each player either 20 points rather than 15, or zero points rather than minus five. So no matter what the other player does, each is better off stealing. One of the most important concepts in game theory is the Nash equilibrium, named after Nobel laureate John Nash. In a game of simultaneous choice, a Nash equilibrium is any point in a payoff matrix from which neither player can improve his outcome by unilaterally changing his choice. In the Odin and Loki example, the strategy of take rather than trade is an equilibrium in the sense that if both end up at 0-0, neither player would be better off changing his choice. An equilibrium is a stable outcome in a game because changing your choice if you're at an equilibrium point would only make you worse off. Some games have multiple Nash equilibria, multiple stable outcomes, but not all of those equilibria are equally good. A common concern is whether something can be done to move from an inferior equilibrium to a superior one in which the players are better off by their own lights. One way to measure an improvement is to compare equilibria and ask ourselves whether there is any other equilibrium in a game such that at least one player is better off and none are worse off. This is called a Pareto improvement, named after the Italian economist Vilfredo Pareto. One payoff Pareto dominates another if at least one player is better off and none are worse off. In the trading game above, there's only one Nash equilibrium, steal, steal, and it's Pareto dominated by the outcome in which both trade rather than both steal. But other games have multiple equilibria. We can illustrate this with a simple game we'll discuss in more detail in another video, the coordination game. Suppose you meet a group of people on a basketball court and want to greet them as friends rather than foes. You can reach out and try to shake their hand, or you might try to give them a fist bump instead. The goal of each stranger is to greet each other in a friendly way, 
but there may be uncertainty about what the local conventions are. The worst case scenario is for one person to reach out for a handshake while the other punches his hand awkwardly. There are two equilibria in this game, both shake or both fist bump. Now let's add a twist. Assume we're afraid of germs, so we'd both rather fist bump than handshake to avoid sweaty palms. In this case, fist bumping is a Pareto improvement over handshaking. Still, in an isolated game with a person you've never met, it's unclear whether fist bumping is the rational strategy, unless the background conventions are to fist bump, or we can communicate or react in real time. In other words, even in a game with multiple Nash equilibria, the fact that one equilibrium Pareto dominates the other doesn't mean the players will end up there. In constructing a game theory matrix, it's often useful to include in the payoffs everything the players care about. Payoffs can include differences in how much players value a particular outcome and how much they care about each other. Economists are often caricatured as thinking that people are selfish and only care about maximizing wealth, but this isn't necessarily true. Economics can be thought of as the science of scarcity, and game theory can be thought of as modeling how diverse agents achieve goals in a world of scarce resources and limited altruism. To take the previous example with Odin and Loki, if the two traders are lovers like Romeo and Juliet, they may take pleasure in promoting each other's welfare. Once we add the extra psychological benefits they get from helping each other, peaceful exchange rather than theft may be their best option. The point of constructing game theoretic models is to simplify real life and see how rational agents make strategic choices. But in doing so, it's crucial not to assume that flesh and blood people with the rich array of emotions and experiences they bring to the table will always conform to the models we create. Mm -hmm.